So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have with us today Ms. Jennifer Kumar, uh, live from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, we are so grateful, ma'am. So it, I know that it is uh, late in the night there and uh, she has taken her time off and only for us. And uh, that's a very magnificent gesture. So let me first extend our entire fraternity thank, thanks to you. And uh, I will just take about a minute or so, just reading out, briefly introducing her to the audience. So Jennifer has over a decade of experience coaching the US client facing professionals in India who manage teams and projects in virtual environments. She understands some of the cultural missteps that professionals who work between the US and India face. She herself has lived and worked in India for about over 10 years. She takes this experience to help teams and professionals like you to work more successfully across cultures understand and mitigate cultural differences to build more effective working relationships, building your team, your reputation, and your business. Jennifer's qualifications include a recent PCC, Professional Coaching Certification from ICF, the International Coaching Federation. She has over 750 coaching hours and over 1,500 training hours and close to 4,000 professionals. So that is a big op. Um, thank you, Jennifer. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Viju. So welcome and uh, good morning to everyone in India today. It's 10 p.m. in the evening here in Salt Lake City. I'm actually quite used to working across time zones because I, as Viju mentioned in my intro that I actually coach and train in India. So I do that online just like I'm doing right now. So um, I, I prefer nighttime. <laughs> so as we say in the US, I'm a night owl to some extent. So yeah, I'm happy that everyone can join. I think I see around 70 people uh, log, more people are logging in, 75 now. Welcome. So I, I wanted to add a, a few things about myself um, in, in, in addition to that bio, just to get a little more flavor of maybe some of the examples and stories I might share today. So as uh, Biju did mention, I have 10 years experience living in India. I actually have been coming to India for more than 20 years. It's almost 25 years now. Many people might be surprised to know that my first flight ever, the first time I ever got on a plane was to come to India, <laughs> the longest flight ever. <laughs> So that was pretty exciting. And since then, if I count the times back and forth to India, it's been about, about 30, 3 zero. So um, I've studied my master's degree in India, and I've also lived in India recently from 2011 to 2017, where I was in Kochi. The place I studied in India was Chennai. So I have, most of my experience um, living in India is in South India. I've traveled to North India too. I know there's quite a few people here who are in North India. So I have definitely been to like Delhi, Agra, Shimla, Kolkata, um, some of those areas, but mostly I'm familiar with South India. Today's topic is actually about working and interacting cross-culturally. So what we're gonna talk about today is some of the cultural traits that help you to try to figure out what people in different cultures might believe in, they might behave like, et cetera, et cetera. So I know that most of your webinars have been kind of listening to the person talk in the last 15 minutes, you get to ask questions. I actually prefer to a more interactive um, setup. So anytime you have a question, it doesn't have to be a question, it can even just be, you know, oh, I heard you say X and you want to share your thoughts. You want to share some feedback, anything you want, anytime you want, you can type it into the chat box. And every five minutes or so, we will be fielding your feedback or questions. And there'll be times when I'm going to ask everyone something. So I want to ask right now. <laughs> um, Maybe you can write in the chat box, uh, where are you sitting in India right now? And I can see that in the chat box. I can open the chat box. If you'd like to, hi. Hi, I'm Lynn from Kochi. I might not be able to say hi to everyone. <laughs> so I see there are definitely some people um, 
trying to log in and say hi. Another coachy, Leah. And then Godwin from Kochi. So, so far, Kochi, Co any other cities represented here? Okay, Trishur, Kanur, Trivandrum. I'm familiar with most of the places in Kerala. I've been to mostly north to south. Oh, Lucknow here in North India, Kolam. And I hope I'm saying that right and not like good, because <laughs> it almost sounds the same to me. Cori Code, yep, familiar with that. Udipur, I haven't been to that place. That's in Rajasthan. I haven't been there. Someday, someday, love to go there. Um, okay, Kochi, and then Trivandrum, Kochi more. So I see a lot of people mostly from Kerala, and then some people are in there from North India. Hey, Karkutum, I know that place. My, uh, my brother-in-law uh, was in the Sainik school there. He was a principal there. Um, Nagpur, okay, I haven't been there. I know about it. <laughs> so hello everyone and hello everyone that said hello to me. <laughs> Sorry, I can't catch everyone's name. It goes a little bit fast. So throughout today, I hope people still stay really engaged. And when I ask some questions, I know it might take a few minutes to type, but it's great to see you're interacting. Um, another Nagpur, another for sure. So perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen. Now, I know we all love PowerPoints. I'm mostly using it just to kind of keep on track and also to kind of help us to see some visuals because, you know, looking at me the whole time might not be that fun. <laughs> so um, this is obviously just the title slide, nothing much to see here. So um, I think some of you might have been able to go into Globe Smart and do the, the uh, assessment. I hope that you had a chance to. Now this screen is going to come back later as well. Um, I'm just giving you the context to what this is. So this would have looked somewhat similar. Maybe they've updated it. It might look a little different now when you go in and use the free version. I have a paid version. Um, so it lets me actually see um, country profile. So that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing India on one side and the U.S. on one side. And that, that you know, every culture will be a little different, but maybe you can see from here. I mean, this is why cultural training is actually so important because oftentimes we kind of are on the opposite side of certain traits and certain belief systems. So it's good to have that context. So we're gonna look a little deeper into this throughout today's session. Um, if you had taken the profile assessment, I'm just curious, I'm gonna to have to take off the slide in a minute to see your, um, and your, your responses in the chat box. But does anyone match up to any of the points here? Um, you can write in the chat box your name and then the point you might match up with in the country. So for instance, I might put Jennifer, um, India, indirect, <laughs> if that was me, if I match up on the blue side, for instance, where India is. Um, I've never seen anyone, I've done this to, with about a couple hundred people, this assessment, and I've never seen anyone match up exactly to, to one country. And people don't normally match up to their own country. Oddly enough, <laughs> most people don't. It's really interesting, although, it's still an interesting assessment to look at and see the ways we can use that. So I'm going to stop the share for a second so we can look in the chat too. I don't see anything yet. Um, I hope that some of you did have a chance to do the assessment. If you didn't, that's okay. This will give you more of a context to what it is all about. And um, then when you get a chance to do it, you can see this again. And you know, if you want the PowerPoint deck, um, you can definitely get in touch with me. For that, um, I'll just type my email address in the chat box right now. And then um, later, you can always email me and I can send you the, the slide deck. That's not, a, not an issue. So I'm not sure if anyone had any, any points that matched up. Um, again, it's okay if you didn't or maybe you're still thinking about it or maybe you're trying to bring it back up on your app <laughs> if, you didn't, if you did finish it. Um, so I think I can go ahead. I'm going to come back to the slide. Like I said, this slide will come up later. This is just to kind of provide the introduction to this um, presentation. So, the, so 
actually, I'm going to go back to the slide just for a second, because like I mentioned, we want to use this mostly as a benchmark. So what we don't want to do is get caught in a trap. And what would the trap be? We don't want those continuums to become stereotypes. I think many of us know what a stereotype is. And usually a stereotype is not a very pleasant, uh, pleasant experience. If you're stereotyped, it's not a pleasant experience. So for instance, we don't want to say, oh yeah, just because on the US side, um, somebody, we see that the US um, assessment people are independent. Does that mean that everyone in the US wants to be independent and that everyone doesn't want to be in a group or that everyone doesn't care about other people? Like it'll be assumptions that we make. So we want to avoid that trap. And I'm going to give some examples in a little bit about how that actually works. All right, so when we think about a stereotype, um, what we don't want to do is get caught in the trap of the language trap. For instance, we don't want to use statements with all. All people from X country are this way. Because there's always going to be somebody who's not like that. Or maybe most people may, may not be like that. <laughs> or like this one. I think it says everyone. My, my face is over it. Everyone. <laughs> everyone from New York City is too impatient. People say that to me all the time. I'm in Utah. And Utah people are pretty relaxed. There's some very, very relaxed people here. I wish I could be like that. But I grew up in New York. And I'm... A little bit impatient, <laughs> but sometimes people think everyone from the U.S. is impatient, so that's a stereotype. But when I meet someone from Utah, I'm walking down the street and I'm making conversation with them, small talk. They'll say, "Oh, so you know, your accent doesn't sound like you're from Utah." Everyone seems to know that <laughs> from my accent. So where are you from? And they'll say, "Oh, I'm from New York State." You're from New York State. You mean you actually have time to stop and talk to me? You're not in a rush and you're actually being pleasant and friendly. So from that, you can guess the Utah um, uh, stereotype of New Yorkers are that we're impatient, we're not friendly, we don't like to make small talk. Not really true, it's just different. There are definitely people who are impatient, <laughs> no doubt about it. And then always is another word we wanna avoid. Like, I always um, notice that people from, I don't know, let's use a company name instead of a country, people from Facebook are just so like relaxed. They just don't care about their work. I don't know if that's true. I'm just making that up, but always. So we don't want to use these words when we're trying to talk about a group of people. We might say some of the times, some of the people from X are like this. Or, you know, I've noticed that there are occasions that people who come from this place could be like this. So when we do cross-cultural training, we try to think of uh, these, these ideas in that, in that way, rather than saying everyone from the U.S. is this way or everyone from India is that way. Everyone from the U.S. likes bland food, right? <laughs> not so true, not so true. <laughs> So, and bland means different things to different people. All right, so when we look at cultures, a lot of people think, oh, the country, India, the US, Canada, South Africa, China, Argentina, um, Chile, they think of a country usually when we say culture, but actually culture has many different identifiers, right? So this kind of more simple graph or it's kind of like a Venn diagram, kind of shows you a little bit more about the complexity of culture. Even within our families, I believe that everyone somewhat has a different culture. You can even take it down to that level because not everyone in the house was um, born in the same place, didn't grow up in the same place. Um, even with siblings, they, the, the sister brother, they would, they would have been born in a different year. They grow up in, with a different set of friends. They go, might go to a different school, for example. But let's look at this diagram from kind of the top. Right side is this way for you, I guess. National culture. Even national culture can be a little confusing. I'm going to turn off my screen for a second because I want to know 
um, especially with so many people here from Kerala, it might be true. Anyone here born outside of India, do you identify with another culture that, uh, because you lived in another country? I do see some, country, uh, some questions here. So while um, I'm waiting to see if anyone actually lived in another country, you can write your you know, name and the country or where you were, if you want to, you don't have to share personal information only if you feel like it, um, like where you grew up or born, if it was not India, for example. Um, okay, so I do see some people did write a few things in here. Um, yes, uh, Biju mentioned that, yes, India is very much indirect. Yeah, I mean, I can, uh, it took, take, still, I'm still getting used to it, even though I've been interacting with people from India for a long time, including my husband, of course, and his family. So let's see, uh, people from uh, France are arrogant. Yeah, so that's a stereotype. Yeah, that's a stereotype. Even Americans feel that way. Even other Europeans feel that way, actually. So it's interesting to learn what different cultures think of a, a culture. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a true one. Um, not true in the sense that people are that way, but it's true that it's a stereotype. Um, is the level of aggressiveness a factor in a culture trait? Yeah, you could say that. Um, for instance, a lot of people, I think, find Americans to be, um, could find Americans to be a little aggressive, depending on how you're identifying or um, how you're defining the word aggressive. Uh, like Americans tend to be somewhat pushy sometimes. I'm saying this as an American. <laughs> I'm saying this as living in another country. That's what I felt people kind of thought about me sometimes. And that could be because of my culture, that could be because of my family culture. Um, and maybe even within India, if you think about different uh, regions, there might be that different types of um, approaches to as well. Um, hi, Dr. Shamsi, <laughs> nice to see you in the chat. Uh, yeah, you lived in the UAE. Perfect, yeah. So you might identify with some Middle Eastern culture, Middle Eastern food, maybe, maybe Arabic. Um, as also with Sean, I see UAE is listed there. And then another Dubai from, I guess it's Atu, I'm guessing. Um, and then uh, Ann Lynn mentioned Kochi grew up in Muscat. Yeah, I've, I actually, Muscat is, is one of the cities, Oman, Oman is one of the countries I've been to beside India, one of the few countries. I actually spent two weeks there about 25 years ago. So I'm a little familiar with Oman, nice place. Um, so some people, yeah have visited different countries in Europe. Very nice. Like, you know, I've never been to Europe. I have no, no context to that. Okay, so um, Jaren has um, lived in Saudi for more than 15 years. Um, then Kuwait by Joel. And Anne said was born in Bahrain. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, from Kochi, but born in Kuwait. So that was Nandana. And then, yeah, some people moved to India at a young age, but they were born elsewhere. Yeah, that's, I think that's kind of a common um, thing I've met from a lot of people who were expats um, outside of India. I mean, Indian expats or NRIs, right? So um, yeah, this is good to, so, so many people already have experience living in another culture. So some of this might not really be new information for you, except for maybe the tool. So I'm just gonna jump back in to the t into the presentation and, um, I definitely will be looking through everyone's um, comments a little bit after the presentation too, because um, I can download the, the comments. If I missed yours, I apologize, but I'm so happy that so many people are interacting. That's so exciting. Okay, so um, national culture, we can see this is complex. Um, and then pe some people can change their citizenship Obviously, if you've lived in, in the Middle East, you probably have not. I don't think that's allowed. But people who come to the US uh, do have an opportunity to change her citizenship. I had a friend from Indonesia. I'm so excited about her. She became a citizen last week. So uh, yeah, it happens for a lot of people. My own family uh, are from Hungary. So they, they also became citizens um, much before I was born, obviously. <laughs> but, so I'm kind of, I guess they call first generation American. Um, so there's your national culture, um, then there's your family culture, or even your personality, which would be different from each person, right? And then you have a corporate culture, or in this case, if you've never worked and you only have studied, your college culture. 
So even moving from school to college is a culture shock in a way, I'm sure. So we have all these different layers. And even if you work in the same profession and you change jobs to a new company, that's a different culture because that company will have a different culture. So, so this is just context to help you to try to think about this. I'm sure many of you have thought about it because you have a lot of experience living all over the place. And many of you might have, I, I asked you about living in another country, but I'm sure many of you have lived within different parts of India. And just like living in another country, if you move to another state in India, there's a different language, different script, different food, different holidays. So it's like living in another country. So um, yeah, so this is just um, to build more context to what we're getting into. All right, so we're back to this. And this is just, again, in case you didn't get to write down these points, you can put this on your grid. And also, you know, if you stay tuned to the end of the presentation, which is like in 15 minutes or so, I'm actually gonna bring up my uh, account um, on GlobeSmart and I'll take your inquiries. Like you want me to look up a certain country to get its profile? Let's see how that goes. You might be curious. Do, especially for those who lived in like Oman or UAE, you, you'll be able to see that profile and say, oh, maybe I match up with that one, or maybe I match up with India, or maybe I don't match up with any. <laughs> I, and I would say take the profile um, in a couple years again and take it and see if it comes out different. I've done this profile like three or four times over the last four years. And actually it turns out different a little bit. Or you can think about it you sit down and do the profile. Okay, I'm in the work environment. I'm in a professional environment. How do I kind of behave? How do I behave with my friends? How do I behave with my family? Maybe as some of you are taking the assessment, you might have, these questions might have came up in your mind. Like, yeah, if I was with my boss or my teacher, of course I would be more formal and use sir or ma'am, but I don't need to do that with my friends or my family. <laughs> so sometimes the context also might change how the result is, which is actually pretty interesting. Um, so the first continuum here, we have independent and interdependent. Pretty, seems pretty straightforward, um, but it's still complicated, a little bit complicated, right? So I wanna tell you a little story. Now I'm only showing these slides so you can take notes off of them. I'm not going to read off the slide because that's boring. Um, so some years ago, I had a friend here in the US who grew up in India. She was from Punjab and she grew up in a joint family. In the US, we call the extended family. So she grew up with a large family. And in that family, um, basically her everything that she did, the way she described it to me, everything that happened to her was because her elders or her parents or grandparents or somebody older than her decided that for her. So that was her environment growing up. When she moved to the US, it was just her and her husband and her son. And they were living here for about two or three years before her mother-in-law came to visit, okay? So her mother-in-law is sitting at home during the day and her son was at school. So when her son came home from school, he said to the mother-in-law, which is his grandmother, Grandma, I want to watch my favorite cartoon. Can't, I'm going to turn the channel. And the boy went up to the, up to the TV and turned the channel to his favorite cartoon. And the grandmother slash mother-in-law wasn't very happy about this. She went to my friend and said, how in the world does a four-year-old boy have a favorite anything? And you know, when my friend told me the story, it just showed me that, you know, there's so many different cultures. Like in the US, um, we, you know, growing up in the US, my family like would applaud me if I had some favorite thing. Like if I didn't have a favorite food, they would be like, oh, what, what do you mean you don't have a favorite food? You have to have something that you like. So if you were to meet someone from the U.S., probably the first questions that they might ask you are about something personal to you. Like, what is your favorite color? What is your favorite food? You know, what do you like to do on the weekend? They won't expect you to answer with something you did with somebody. They don't really care about hearing about your family usually 
or your friends. They just want to know about you personally. So this is how these things come out in the culture. And it's a little different, obviously. Um, I think I might have seen something come up in the chat. I'm not sure if I missed anything here. Um, I think, Biju, are you online? Did I miss any comments from any participants? Because um, I saw some pinks coming I, I'm in. online. No, you didn't miss much. Okay, there were a lot of comments about where they live, mostly. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I just, I just keep, I keep seeing things come through, which is exciting. Please continue to share your comments. <laughs> I definitely will look through everything after we're done as well. Um, so the other thing when we're looking at these continuums, and this is kind of a, a, a good visual to get to the point of what I'm trying to say with that story, is when we look at a continuum, we say, okay, people are more independent in the US. So what we're actually seeing is a top 10%. We're seeing the behavior. We're seeing, okay, people in the US might be more, way more comfortable than people from interdependent cultures um, doing things all by themselves. Um, even to the extent mountain climbing or skydiving or some really adventurous, scary things. Ameri There's a lot of Americans who are very open and willing to do all that stuff all by themselves. They don't want anyone with them at all. Um, and for some people from some cultures, that seems very strange. Um, me personally, mm, maybe as I get older, I would never want to do anything alone. But maybe if I was younger, <laughs> I'd be like, okay, I'll go do it by myself. Um, where maybe in other cultures, that thought would never come across someone's mind that they would do, like I went to India all by myself 25 years ago. No family came with me, no friends came with me, and people in, in some, a lot of people in India, my classmates even asked me, are you crazy or brave? <laughs> I don't know what the right answer to that was, but maybe that's why they were asking me that question. So what, we only see the top 10%. We see how people eat. We see how people dress. We might see how they behave in a, in a social situation or in a religious event. But we don't really know why they do that. What drives a person to do that? What are their values? Why, what do they assume in life? What do they value the most as far as what, based on culture, religion, belief system? That's the 90% we don't see. And it's not always easy to know that stuff. And oftentimes we don't really know, but we can make some guesses. Um, and then hopefully if we try to understand people's motivation, why they're doing something the way they're doing it, we can try to relate to them better. This is not just between cultures, but even you know, people who are next door, our neighbors sometimes. So um, I just showed, this is called the cultural iceberg, by the way, I forgot to, I, I took, I think the title's on the side, but this is a very popular image used in cross-cultural training programs. Um, in India, the, I've seen a, a similar image. Um, it was a tree in my microphone's falling out. Sorry about that. So in India, um, in some cross-cultural training programs that were um, delivered by Indian trainers, I, I've seen the, the tree. So the tree itself with the leaves on top would be like the top of the iceberg, what you see there. And then the roots and everything would be like the 90%, what you don't really see. Um, and I, I like that analogy too. I, I might actually like that analogy a little bit better than the iceberg. <laughs> So, um, but I didn't have that image to share with you. Okay, perfect. So we're going to go back to the, the next set of um, variables here on the continuum. Egalitarianism, a long word, and maybe I didn't pronounce it right. I don't know. But that means when you see someone as equal, um, and the other side is status. So status obviously means you see that the tip of the iceberg, sir, ma'am much more common in India. Maybe, maybe it's more common in certain parts of India. I don't know. In the US, we, uh, there are certain areas of the US where people use sir and ma'am. And if you were to use someone's name, they would get offended. Um, but generally, in the US, people prefer to be called by their first name, except in the case where a student in a school and the student is under 18 and they have a teacher. That would be the only exception, really. Um, other ways, even in college where we are um, encouraged to call our teachers by their name or doctor plus their name. If I had a PhD, Dr. Jennifer, for example. I don't think I would want to be called doctor though. <laughs> I'll just go for Jennifer. So um, yeah, so we can see that 
different cultures might have a different view of this. In India, there's the uncle and auntie uh, concept, which you could say is a little bit about status. In the US, we really don't use that term. The only people we call on aunt, we use the term aunt or uncle, are our actual aunts and uncles in our family. We don't call like other adults in our neighborhood or our parents' friends as auntie or uncle. We would actually call our parents, when I was growing up, um, I was taught to call my parents' friends like Mr. Smith or Ms. Uh, Jones or whatever their name was, um, their last name was. But now, like my sister, her kids call her friends by their first name which might be considered very strange in India. I, I actually consider that strange. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's way too formal for a little kid to call um, an adult by their first name, but maybe I'm old fashioned. I don't know. <laughs> so, so status. And also it's not just based on culture, but we can say industry, uh, profession. So there's some professions like software in the software industry, where we tend to think of people as being more relaxed, a little more casual, calling people by their first name. Some of you might know about the company UST Global. I've done a lot of work there. And I don't know, back five, six years ago, they used to have this jar in um, some of the offices called the sir ma'am jar and if you said sir ma'am you have to actually put money in there um you were fined and then they would um they would donate that money to a charity um that was how they were trying to get people to follow uh the the equality culture um, but maybe if you're in a certain industry like banking or I don't know, your lawyer or some of some of those kind of older types of, of professions probably they're a little more status oriented um, where you might need to use more titles to refer to people. And that's that how it is in the US, I, I'm pretty sure as well. And then there's just different company cultures as well. All right, so that's that one. Risk and certainty. So, you know, when I was working in, in Kerala, I uh, was working with a lot of startup companies and they would say to me, hey, Jennifer, you know, we don't really have a lot of this um, startup capital here in India. I mean, it's changed a little bit. I'm quoting something from, you know, seven years ago, maybe now. <laughs> so seven or eight years ago, we don't have a lot of startup capital here um, and people really aren't that, you know, adventurous. They won't just quit their jobs to start a business as maybe some people in the US are. So what that was telling me was that there are a lot of people in India who are risk averse. They, they don't really like risk. They like that comfortable life where they're kind of getting you know, regular paycheck and um, quitting your job to start a business would be unheard of. Um, not that there aren't certain places in the U.S. where that's not true, but definitely if you're in a Silicon Valley or some big cities where a lot of startups are, obviously growing up around that, people are a little more, I would say, um, uh, ready to take that risk. But in general, I think in the U.S. there are definitely, I would say, people under 35 are, are more open to taking risks, and even their parents are more um, open to them taking risks than my parents would be, for example. Okay, so direct and indirect. Now this is always, and I know I think Biju was the one who mentioned this, you know, India is indirect. So yes, um, so there's yeses and no's to how this operates, I feel, um, because there are definitely, I would, from the cultural knowledge I've read and experience. I would say definitely Eastern cultures, um, if you're kind of making a big generalization, Eastern cultures where India would fit in are more indirect and Western cultures where the US is, is considered more direct. So what does that really mean? Um, it also means that people in the US really take you at your word, where maybe in indirect cultures, uh, people look for more context. They want to know who you are. How are you related to me? Um, you know, even sit down and want to have tea with you more or, or look at your body language more. All of that context makes a big difference and the words themselves may not make as much of a difference all the time. Um, so like in the US, it's very important to say thank you a lot. Please, thank you, and sorry are like the three things you'll hear every American say. Probably you'll get tired of hearing it if you interacted with Americans. Um, however, 
again, we don't want to say all Americans are direct all the time, or even all Indians are indirect all the time. There will be exceptions to the rule. I'm not sure what the exceptions are in India because I didn't grow up there. If you know an exception, you can definitely write it in the chat box. But in the US, the exception is saying no. A lot of people in India that I've trained are very surprised about this because it's actually something that Indians and Americans have in common. We really don't like to say no directly. We, we kind of go around the bush um, and we, we want it to be a win-win. Yes, there are definitely gonna be people in America that say no directly. And usually we say, you know, they're not the nicest people to be around. <laughs> but in general, most people will try to create a compromise because um, they don't want you to feel bad. Um, so they'll try to ask different questions to see, you know, how they can change something um, or do maybe do something different to make you feel better rather than come straight out and say no. The other place where we, and when I say we Americans are indirect is giving feedback. So if we have to get feedback from our managers or we have to give feedback to somebody, generally we kind of do a formula. We say something nice, we say something not so nice, and then we say something nice again. So I'm going to turn off the screen share for a second. Um, I do see some questions in there. I'm, I'll get to those in just a second. Um, what I want to do is I want to give you the example of giving feedback. I want you to pick out what the negative feedback in this is, because some people are not able to pick it out. And this is where it gets tricky when you're interacting with someone from a different culture. How do I pick out what they're actually trying to say to me? Okay, so I'm a manager and I'm giving someone feedback about their report. Okay, so listen carefully. So yeah, I got your report. I read through it. It was 10 pages long. Uh, it took me a while to read that report, actually, because it, I didn't expect it to be 10 pages, but that's okay. That's not a problem. Um, I, and I, I do understand our, our annual report and all of our earnings and everything. However, when I was looking at section number three, um, th that section actually seems to be written in a different format than we're used to. So I'm just curious, how did you come across uh, that format and what makes it stand out to you? Because usually, you know, we don't use that format. But overall, otherwise, I really like the report. What do you think is the negative feedback? Akash, yes, that's one point. Yeah, actually, that's one uh, thing that's uh, the negative feedback. Section three, yes. Oh, Biju, maybe. Yeah, plagiarizing. Yeah, uh, that would be a very indirect way of saying that by an American. I think Americans might actually come actually very straight out and say, did you, did you copy this from somewhere? Because I don't like that. But yes, um, the, about the format says Pallavi. Yeah, so you guys are good. You, you can pick out um, some of these things. So that's where listening becomes really important. When you're interacting with someone from a different culture, even if they're speaking the same language, like you're understanding my English, I think I'm not speaking too fast and my accent isn't too bad. So most of you are able to pick up what I'm saying. Um, so even when we speak the same language, um, that doesn't mean that we're always going to understand each other. There's so many different kinds of Englishes, Indian English, American English, and then the cultural use of that language is going to be very different. Um, so let me see what else I got here in the chat box while I'm here. Um, so I can see that. Uh, Vinod, okay, Vinod, um, I can speak English, Hindi, Malayalam, Bengali, Oriya, and Tamil. So do you know, if you were to tell any American that, they would just be silent for like a long time <laughs> because Americans don't understand the, con most Americans have no idea that you can be multilingual. Bilingual is even a hard concept for most Americans to really grasp. Um, so the me so many languages, um, is, I mean, I admire anyone who could even really be fluent in more than one language, let alone how many you have listed there. That's an incredible and hats off. And of course, you probably don't think it's any big deal. And so many people from India can speak multiple languages and it's, it's necessary in India. But in the US, I think we're spoiled. We don't need to do that. Um, okay, so Leah mentioned that Airtel. Yep, I'm familiar with Airtel. 
um, the employees can call each other by their first name, even the CEO. Yeah, so that's a company culture that they've set um, where equality is important. And maybe there's other values under that um, is why that behavior is part of their co company culture. Um, so Anstead asked, if I were to move to a different country, to what extent would my profile change and how long would it typically take to change? That is an intense question and a good one because I think it's different for everybody. Um, it's not really something that we can predict and we don't really know how we're going to change when we move to another country. We really can't um, really grasp that change, I think. We can't, we can't plan it out, for example. We can't say, oh yeah, I'm moving to the US, so therefore I'm gonna become more independent. Or I'm moving to the US, therefore I'm not gonna become independent. We really don't know how once we're immersed in that culture, things are gonna change for us. Like, I'll give you an example. Questions are very important thing to ask to everyone in the US. Um, even your family friends, that's how we start. Any conversation is with a question and a questioning tone. And it's not considered rude most of the time. But in India, I picked up a different habit, which is using statements. So when I came back to the US, to US and I was like tr trying to talk to my sister and everything, after a couple months, she actually called, you know, she, we were talking on the phone and she said, hey, Jennifer, I'm really thinking that you and I really aren't very close anymore now that you've been to India for a long time. And I'm like, why? What did I do? And she's like, you never ask me questions anymore. You only say stuff, but you don't ask me about my life. And then I stopped. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're right. Because I like in India, when I was, this is just my experience, and this might not be really be an Indian cultural thing, but my experience in India, when I asked a lot of questions, people would not really answer me. But when I turned those questions into statements with a full stop at the end, people would respond to me. <laughs> So I just took that habit and I then brought it back to the US with me, which it didn't work here. And I would never have been able to predict that. So that's just an example, but that's a great question. Um, maybe some of your colleagues or your, I'm sorry, classmates can also share their experiences with you um, about their move to different country and, you know, how they may or may not have changed. Now, as far as the profile is concerned, I, I can't really I, um, tell you exactly, but maybe for instance on that one, um, I, I would say qu questioning seems kind of like a direct thing to do. Um, maybe I wouldn't have thought questioning is direct before uh, living in India for a long time, um, but maybe I feel like I'm more indirect now. Um, I don't know. So, um, okay, so then everyone else has written about the, the example, and then Biju mentions that, uh, yes, of course, most Indians can read and speak three, at least three languages. Yeah, of course. So, you know, in our education system in the US, that's not really part of our experience. Um, I did learn Spanish for four years, but I didn't grow in, in high school. I learned Spanish, but I didn't have anyone to speak it to. There was no Spanish speaking people in my town. So now I have lost that ability. Um, yeah, all right. So I'm going to go back. We have, I think, one more continuum to look at. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. This is awesome. It gets me excited. All right. So task versus relationship. So what this refers to is that in some cultures, if you're on the relationship side, you really need to get to know somebody before you can do work with them. Um, and then if you're on the task side, you really don't care anything personal about that person. You just want to know that they're good enough for that job, that they have the skill set for that job. In the US, people tend to be more task oriented, which means there were colleagues I worked with for five years, okay? And I didn't know until the four and a half year mark that one of those colleagues literally was my neighbor. I mean, lived kind of on the next block. So, it probably for some people in India that would be considered very strange, definitely in Kochi. I remember when people used to come up and introduce themselves to me. So where do you stay? So I would say that it's like the name of the town. Okay, so what part of the town do you stay in? What what um what development do you live next to? Oh, you live in the you live in that complex. Um, do you know X person? Oh, how many houses do they live down from you? If you ask those 
questions to someone in the US, especially someone that you're working with, they wouldn't like that. <laughs> They, most places, people won't like those questions in the workplace, unless you're friends with them. But if you're getting to know them, they would find that actually like you're, you know, being too personal. So people in the U.S. tend to really just get to the job and get it done. That doesn't mean they don't like to make small talk. Small talk is important, but they're more interested in the fact that you're going to get the job done, that you're good at what you do. So I think... Now we're done with those continuums. So that takes me to the last kind of slide, which is not a continuum, but more like um, another trait that's not in this, this continuum list. So when we talk about task and relationship, the other thing that often comes up is time management. So time management in different cultures is also different. Like you can be perfect with the task with an American, but if you're like five minutes late every day to the meeting, um, it doesn't matter how perfect your task is. If you are late every day, they're, they're going to lose confidence that you can do the job well. Um, so when we look at different cultures, we have to see how do they manage time and how is that going to influence how they might think of me in getting my work done. So let's say something starts at 10 o'clock. Um, like I had to be, I had to be in this webinar 10 PM for me today. So in the U.S., in the East Coast, the further East Coast you go, the more they, you know, 10 o'clock is actually late, for example. Actually, if you start the meeting at 10, that's late in, in New York State, New York City for sure. So normally we would start a meeting five minutes early in New York State. Why? Because we want, you know, we want everyone in the room, um, people make a little small talk to start off, and then exactly at 10, we get into the content. And we end that meeting by say 9.45, 9.50. But in other cultures, if you were to come in at five minutes early, um, it doesn't really matter. People, maybe nobody's there, you know? And also the other thing I should mention in the US, if um, it, like, let's say even you know someone who's working with US clients, it's okay if you are there before your client is in that meeting. In fact, it doesn't, they would be, they would be, they would, take that as a sign of respect that you're there before they are. But like, for instance, when I was studying in India, I remember, I remember we would wait outside the classroom and then until the teacher went inside. When I first came and studied in the college, um, I went into the room up and all my classmates were standing outside. Now I realize I made a mistake. I should not have went in because the, the teacher wasn't there. But in the US, we always go into the room, even if the teacher's not there. That's that equality, another part of the equality that we're looking at. The teacher in the US will be offended if we're waiting outside the room for him. So you can see the cultural difference there. So, okay, so 10 minutes before 10 o'clock. Um, is that too early or is that on time? Well, that I think I haven't experienced a culture where that's on time. I would, in the US, it's mostly been like, say it would be five minutes before the start time. Um, there are some people that come in 10 minutes early if they're the presenter. It's a big day. It's a new project. It's a new um, client that you're working with. Yes, you actually want to be that, there 10 minutes early in that case. But if it's a general everyday kind of a situation, five minutes is good in the U.S. Now, this other clock on the right side shows 10 minutes after 10. This five minutes after 10 and 10 minutes after 10, I've noticed in Utah actually, you know, is acceptable. Um, people will come in late, people make small talk, and then they get on with the meeting late. I mean, I haven't worked in a company here in Utah, but I have been to professional events. Um, and professional events in New York State always start exactly on time. And if they don't, everyone will think you're irresponsible and you're not good at what you do. But here in Utah, it's more like, hey, you know, it's okay if we start a little bit late. In fact, in fact, that's good because we can get to know each other. So it feels more like India in some ways, which I actually like. So, so different cultures see time different. Um, I was part of a webinar the other day where they were hosting it from Egypt. So they, they actually opened the webinar exactly, say, at 10 o'clock. They opened it we could see the presenters, but the presenters didn't start actually presenting till 1015. And I talked to a couple people and apparently in Egypt, this might be acceptable and not considered late because they actually 
opened the session at 10, even though they didn't start the content till 1015. But if they were presenting that to someone in the US or the UK or some other time, Japan, for example, they're very time conscious, um, they would be offended. And they would probably think that whoever is organizing this is not respecting their time. So these are some other cultural variables here. Um, okay, so we're back to this comparison. And what I want to do now is I think we have a few minutes. Yeah, we still have a few minutes left. So I don't know if anyone has any country um, they would like me to look up on my, my handy dandy app here. Um, let's see. Iceland, Canada. Okay. Uh, let me get my screen ready. And let me show you this. So let's see, Iceland. Oh, where did it go? Oh, maybe Iceland is not in this. That's very weird. Okay, Iceland, Canada, Canada will be here. So Iceland um, apparently is not part of their app. I would have liked to see that one too. Um, I, I'm not able to see the chat box, Biju. Um, would you be able to help me with understanding some of the other countries listed there? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to see. Okay, one minute. Okay. Uh, no, I, I don't think uh, they followed your uh, question actually. Um, okay, so right now, if you, um, everyone there, if you see the screen, I can bring up other countries so you can see their profile. Um, I can put in two or three at one time. Um, are there other countries you'd like to see? I showed you the US and India already. Uh, um, if, if I may uh, ask, uh, can you bring in China? Because that's where most China. of China is the businesses here. And maybe we'll add one more since some people said UAE. I'll put that one in yeah, here as UAE well. Is well. Um, okay, so let's see how these compare and contrast to your profile here. Meanwhile, you can think of some, oh, they kicked me out. I guess I got logged out. Let me log back in. <laughs> I was, uh, I was uh, idle for too long. All right, I guess I have to put that back in. Um, let's see. Okay, so we had Canada and we had China and we had UAE. There we go. Let's see. Hopefully it will come up now. So you can see here's some difference here. And you can see what my profile is. I don't remember when I took this. It wasn't recently. Maybe last year I took my profile. So you can see I, in some ways, I kind of match up with China and UAE. Um, I don't match up with Canada. Ironic, isn't it? <laughs> it's probably after living in India, that's how my profile probably changed. I never took this before moving to India, so I don't know what it would have been at that point. Um, but you can see how you can try to get it to match up to certain countries, certain, I mean, my dots aren't exactly on those dots, but they're close enough to kind of say, okay, I might, I might actually work well with people from UAE and China when it comes to status, certainty, indirectness, and relationship. Maybe, although it looks like the UAE is really far over on relationship. That might be a little tough for me. I would have to find a way to fill in that gap. Um, but I'm more, I'm more independent um, than UAE and China would be. But, but Canada's way more independent than I am apparently. <laughs> I don't know how that works, but anyway, this might be some good interesting um, insight to compare your own profile against. Um, I don't know if any other countries um, were of interest to anyone else, uh, Biju? Not able to see the chat right now, so I think it got stuck on someone else's chat from way back when we got started. Okay, so um, I think you get kind of oops, I think I pressed the wrong button there. Okay, you might get that kind of uh, a good idea of what that profile system actually works like. Um, okay, so there's a couple more being asked. Um, let me see, we have. 
Oh, there's a lot actually. You know, um, also I'll, I'll, what I'll do is I'll take a couple of these right now and maybe I can actually take screenshots shots and send them to you too. I'll take uh, New Zealand, South Africa and Germany for the next one. I, I'll just do one more. So New Zealand, okay, South Africa and Germany. All right, let's see. Let's see how this works. Ah, you can see that's very different. This is a very different kind of a profile than the previous one, especially if you compare it against my profile. Um, I wonder if any of these might match up with any other profiles of anyone on the webinar today. It's very Jennifer, interesting. Yes? We can't see your screen. Uh, we can't sh share. Oh, 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 thank you. I didn't realize that. I must have turned it off and forgot to turn it back on. Okay. Here we go. I hope you can see now. So you can kind of see this. I'll try to um, note down the other countries and you know, if you email me, I can um, send you all the screenshots and everything. So therefore you can see some of the other um, country profiles. I'll try to save the chat from uh, the webinar today so I can do that for you. It's actually interesting for me as well. Um, so I'm going to turn this off. I know we're getting close to the time. This is again, another American trait, but I'm, I'm willing to stay a little longer if you have more time. Um, but I, I, you might have other classes uh, that you have to attend today as well. So I don't want to keep you from that. So someone did mention how is cultural competence achieved? This is, this is an interesting question because I think it depends on so many factors. Um, in my experience and in my opinion, I think one is just being aware of the surroundings and empathetic to who we're interacting with and trying to kind of adjust. If we notice something is different, um, trying to adjust our behavior to that. Now, where's the caveat in this? This is actually where Authentic Journeys, my company's name, come in um, with cross-cultural um, adjustment is we want to remain authentic to ourselves when we're in another country. We don't want to compromise our own identity to um, just to fit in. Nobody really wants to do that, even in their own country. So we have to kind of come to a balance. So some things we'll be able to um, adjust to. Some things we won't be able to adjust to. Sometimes we can't really foresee what we, we will be able to adjust to. And sometimes we'll be surprised at what we, what we can actually adjust to. Um, so I think for those of you who have lived in different countries, this is actually a good, um, a good discussion point for everyone to have. So are there any other questions as we come to an end of the session today? Um, maybe I'll throw one out too is, what do you uh, think Matt, about uh, this? Jennifer, yes? Jennifer, there's one question from uh, sure. Anlin. Anlin okay. David, he asks, uh, in your opinion, which is more appropriate, speaking directly or speaking indirectly and being misunderstood? In your opinion, hmm. which is more appropriate? So this is a very interesting question. It's not, it's not actually easy to answer this because there's so many scenarios. So, and I think sometimes we ourselves really don't know if we are being direct or indirect. Um, I mean, sometimes we really know when we're being direct, um, but other times we really don't realize it. Like, for example, when I was working in India, um, I had been in India long enough to understand that people who work under you don't really tend to question you. Um, and then this, this girl came from Belgium and she went right up to the client I was working with and said, why did you do it this way? You should do it that way. Like in the Western cu culture, that would be considered like respectful actually. I mean, she didn't say exactly like that, um, but she said something like, I, I think you shouldn't do this, you should do that which is actually way more direct than asking it as a question. And I was shocked and embarrassed. Um, I, I might have been, I might have been um, guilty of these kind of statements myself before I really lived in India for a while, not realizing that it's not really appropriate. So sometimes we really don't know um, what we're doing and we don't really know how it impacts the other person because we haven't learned about the culture enough yet. Um, again, this is where if you have opportunity to really observe and um, just see how people are interacting, it might help. 
Um, also, that's where the profile kind of comes in handy. You can kind of see, okay, um, I see certain countries are indirect and some are direct. So if that country is indirect, maybe it's a good idea for me to try to be indirect. Again, as my example shared, that I shared, sometimes indirectness in different countries looks a little different. But try your best and then, you know, f find a way in that culture or with that person to let them know that you are sorry or you made a mistake if you realize that sometime later. Um, then that just comes down to the relationship you might have with that person. Then not really looking at them as a culture. Like, for instance, when I was living in Chennai, I was the only American. I was a token American. So everyone would think, oh, if I do this with Jennifer, it must be that way with all Americans. No, we don't want to treat anyone like that, right? That's not really the right approach. Um, all right, any other, were there yeah, any other there's, questions? There's one more, one more from Dr. Rajesh. How to okay. overcome challenges arising through cross-cultural communication? Okay, so that's a similar type of question as the previous one in a way, but not exactly. Um, so there's still a lot of different um, contexts that we could build here around that, I guess. So, um, of course, if you're both talking in the same language, um, I would still not assume it's always the same language. Um, even within India, the English that's used is different in different parts of India. Not just how it sounds, but the words that people use is different. How they're using the language is different. So I think the first key is just being aware that when we're in a you know, new situation, um, that sometimes our language, even if it appears to be the same on the outside, might not be understood by that person who's receiving it the same way we intend it. And of course, it's not just cross-cultural, even with it, our families as well. And that's where these tools can actually help us to actually understand each other better, the same people in our same room, in our same team, in our same classroom. So um, that's kind of a long question to answer. So I don't know if I've shed any insight into that, but that's kind of a short answer to that, a really short answer to that, I guess. Um, were there any other questions? One minute, I'm just going to. Okay. Um, there was a long question from Shamsi. I mean, there was, uh, I'll just read it out to you. Uh, it's okay. up in the chat box. Um, conflicting, conflicting working styles might exist right when we were working in a culturally diversified team. How to tackle it? And colleagues from different cultures can also bring with them different workplace attitudes, values, behaviors, mm. and etiquette. While this can be enriching and even beneficial in a diverse professional environment, they can also cause misunderstandings or ill feelings between team members. How do we deal with this? So yeah, I would say one way I tackle this, and I mean, you can't always go back in time, but if you're in a situation where you're a manager of a team or you're working in a company that has offices in different countries, let's say, and you're working in virtually now, because that's what we're all doing. When you start a new project or a new interaction with another team, I would, I would have a meeting and just kind of discuss, you know, how our team works. You can share that kind of uh, very, um, broadly. So our team likes to work this way. We ex kind of, these are some of the expectations we set in our team. And how about you? How does your team set expectations to get work done? Um, and, and some of these are kind of important and some are basic, like, okay, when do you need to take time off? Because even that becomes a cultural, cross-cultural problem because everyone has different holidays that they observe. And um, we might not always know when they have fall or when they're going to happen. So, you know, kind of starting the relationship with kind of knowing what the expectation is. Now, even that type of expectation meeting is kind of something that a lot of these virtual team experts uh, advise people to do. But I also think it's a, still a very Western thing because when I've advised um, teams in India to try to do this, there's a lot of teams who hesitate to do this because they feel it's too direct of approach. Um, and it is actually kind of direct now that I think about it. I mean, I wouldn't have thought that way 10 years ago, um, but it can be a very direct approach, but it depends on how it's um, conducted. And it has helped some of the teams I've um, worked with to actually create better working relationships and just kind of understand how people uh, operate in different cultures. I see Biju's back in. Okay, so 
Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you were talking about time and I shouldn't be taking yes. more of your time. is already five minutes behind. Uh, so, I must say, any more questions from anyone? Please shoot or you can just type in. There is one more question that just popped up. Please. I can stay a few more minutes. Okay, That's not a problem. So, I do see like 120 people still yeah, here. I mean, so, I'm very excited about that. <laughs> You know, I was very really indirect when I said, you asked me how many would be there. So I was a little indirect. I said 80 because I knew it would be more, but then I wouldn't like to embarrass you. So <laughs> that's how it was. It was much more. It was an overly subscribed, uh, uh, subscribed webinar, I would say. I, I have just curious about, you said about the cultural iceberg in America. I mean, you said 10 percent is open. Uh, you know, uh, we in India, we understand America through Hollywood movies, mostly. Mm -hmm. And Hollywood serials and all that. But I believe that's not what true American family values are. I mean, how would you comment that? How would you comment I that? would, yes, this is a perfect question because I, I think some people on the call today are familiar with North Indian soap operas, um, what's known as the Sas Bahu <laughs> type of serials. Now I've seen some of those before I came to India. So I expected a lot to see a lot of women cleaning toilets and fancy saris. I was very upset not to see that. So, so we can see that from, you know, from popular cinema, we, we get only a kind of a basic idea how people might actually be behaving or believing in the world. We get a basic idea, but we, we don't really, we shouldn't kind of base that on real life because we know the media in our own society isn't how we really live. Um, they, they sensationalize all the TV shows right? So just to make you watch it. If it was like our ordinary life, nobody would want to watch it. So, so there are some, there's some truth to some of those things. You can definitely pick up some idioms and phrases and accents. I've worked with a lot of people who've learned, you know, conversational English from American movies. Um, that's pretty impressive in my opinion. <laughs> but as far as really trying to understand a culture through popular media, I think it's not really the best idea. If you have a chance now with the internet, we have so many opportunities to jump online and try to chat with someone on Facebook or whatever. Americans are pretty open to, you know, if you have a friend on Facebook, um, very open with talking about American culture. I would not ask them about their relationship status. I would not ask them about, you know, why or why not they don't have jobs or whatever, but you can ask general questions about American culture and most people will, you know, be more than happy to share something with you about that. Okay. All right. All right so, uh, we will, uh, wind up this webinar. Any, any more? No. Uh, I do so see one thank you, more. Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. I see one more question. I could, I could feel that okay. one. You can that's buy okay. It. Yes. Uh, it. Yeah. Vidya buy has asked how necessary it is to adopt the culture of a particular place. As long as one is polite and efficient at work, is it considered odd if a person does not blend in much? Hmm. Okay. So I would say it really depends on a lot of different factors. Um, it, it, it is, at least with my understanding between India and the U.S., um, what I feel in both cultures is it's good when you're in an office place to try to make small talk and get to know people. Um, in both of our cultures, I think that's a very common um, way to build relationships. And it also helps us to talk about complicated and difficult topics when that situation comes up. We know that person's personality a little bit more. Of course, in India, you might, you might take those small talk questions a little bit more um, personal, you might know that person's family or extended family, where in the U.S. you might only ask about that person as an individual. Um, but I don't think Americans necessarily expect everyone to blend in 100%. There is the myth that the American culture is the same throughout the U.S., and that is a myth. That's not true at all. Um, myself, having lived in various places in the U.S., I know that's not true. Um, but yeah, you can blend in to the extent you feel comfortable and believe it or not, even the Americans, like if you're in the U S and in office, not all Americans feel like they fit in, even though they're American. So, um, maybe, you, maybe if you're kind of in the middle, you might find one of those people to really kind of be friends with because, um, they would really help you to understand things on a different level. Yeah. We have one more, uh, from Pallavi Shastri. 
Do you think the status of a person depend upon the place where they come from? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, my initial reaction is yes, because our culture creates our context. So our culture means not just our national culture, but our religion, our beliefs, our values. Um, so many um, elements there would actually influence how we approach life. Um, so I, I, you know, I grew up in a certain way. Um, I, I went to a, I, I used to go to a, a Baptist church. So maybe when you grew up, you might, I, who asked the question? I'm sorry. Pallavi Shastri, I think she is from okay, North Pallavi, India. she asked again. Yeah, so Pallavi, may, I'm guessing, and I could be totally wrong, and I'm sorry if this is a wrong assumption, but maybe you grew up going to a Hindu temple. So you can see even from those two experiences, my going to a church and you're going to a temple, that would influence how we see things differently. So I do think that there is a, a difference in how two people will uh, uh, you know, adjust to a different culture based on their context growing up in certain family scenarios and things like that. If we go back to that one diagram I showed with national culture, family culture, and work or co college culture. Yes, I do believe that. So. Okay. Yeah, in India, there's a lot of things. I used to work in Chennai. I came from Mumbai, Bombay then. And then everyone in Chennai used to look up to me because I was considered as a Bombay man. You know, it's little more than the Chennai man does. So this Absolutely nonsense, but that is how it is. Okay. Uh, all right, there's one more. This is Trump. No, the same question. He has asked twice the same question. Okay. Oh, I see. All right. I see. All right, Jennifer. So uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you very, very much. And thanks to Dr. Chamti also for arranging this. And uh, I think on behalf of Amity University and the audience, I should extend our deep thanks to you and especially you taking your time off you know it's not really easy uh, to almost it's about 11 11 p.m right there now 11 15 uh, yep <laughs> oh yeah yeah thanks Jennifer thanks a lot uh, from the bottom of our hearts we thank you thank you very much well thank you for having me so much appreciate it and have a good day everyone and happy Gandhi Jayanti this Friday I think that's okay. holiday thank you <laughs> okay thank have you. a good day thank everyone you. see you